Today is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. It's also the feast day of Saints Abnet and Senan. So the second oration, secret and post-communion we pray at Mass today is from their feast day. Also next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month. So there will be a blessing of religious articles after Mass next Sunday. And also looking forward, August 15th, it is the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There will be a Mass here on that day at 8 a.m. So that's the Holy Day of Obligation, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin. I believe it's a Tuesday, so the uh, August 15th Mass here will be at 8 a.m. The Epistle of Pundit read for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, let us not covet evil things, as they also coveted. Neither become ye idolaters, as some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted, and perish by the serpents. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them in figure, and they are written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed, lest he fall. Let no temptation take hold of you, but such as is human. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make also issue with temptation, that you may be able to bear it. And the Holy Gospel. There's a gospel taken from St. Luke. Chapter 19, verses 41 through 47. At that time, when Jesus drew near Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known, and this, in this, and that in this thy day, the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and straighten thee on every side and beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee. And they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus are the words of today's Holy Gospel. <clears throat> If thou also hadst known, and that, this in, that in this thy day, the things that are for thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes, because thou didst not know the day of thy visitation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That which the gospel speaks to us today about Jerusalem and the people of Israel is a figure of what takes place regarding whole nations and individuals. In the life of both, there are turning points in their history we might call the visitations of God. In both individuals and nations, if they would uh, use these hours profitably according to the gracious will of God, then they will be by them, use them to start new blessings. But woe to them who, like the Jews, did not know the hour of their visitation. It's of the highest importance that we should comprehend and utilize well the visitations of divine grace. Visitations of God are those moments and events in which our Lord impresses upon us either by sorrows or by joys. Every event arranged or permitted by the providence of God, every effort of his love for our salvation, whether to encourage us or to warn us, to reward us or to punish us, to help us or to seemingly abandon us, is called a visitation of God. It is true that our faith tells us there's no moment in which God's mercy and love are not near to us. Our lives in their important events, as well as the smallest details, are arranged by the providence of Almighty God and His goodness. The history of the Israelites is a striking figure of human life. That which we see in the accounts of the once chosen people we see in the history of every human heart. Our Lord visited his people first through the patriarchs, whose eyes were directed to a glorious future, and they were illumined by divine light, while the rest of the world was bound up in paganism. God visited his people in love and mercy through Moses, 
who delivered them from the bondage of Egypt, delivered, divided the waters of the Red Sea, and performed great miracles in the desert. Almighty God gave his commandments to them, and he spoke to Moses with his own mouth. God led them to the promised land and drove out the inhabitants there, the heathen inhabitants, and gave to Israel that land for an inheritance. He gave them great and powerful kings, and he had his temple erected among them so that he, God, might remain always with them by the visitations of his grace. Then the prophets were future visitations of the mercy of God, who warned the people against the idolatrous worship and paganism, and spoke to them about a Redeemer who was to come. And last of all, in the fullness of time, the only begotten Son of God appeared in human flesh and visited his people for 33 years. He dwelt in their midst. They could hear the words of divine wisdom from his very own lips. And they were to be witnesses of his almighty power by the miracles that he wrought. Well, the history of the Jewish nation, which is so rich in the mercy and love of God, resembles the life of man. Each one, each man chosen as a child of God, created his own image and likeness. And we find in each one days filled with proofs of the divinity and divine love and mercy. Our Lord visits us in the very beginning of our lives, sanctifying us, making a covenant with us of mercy, and just as he did with his once chosen people. Well, the visitations of God and tenderness towards the Hebrews were often followed by visitations of the divine wrath and divine punishment whenever that people failed to regard the graciousness and the great calls of Almighty God or became unworthy of God's love. They were delivered by divine justice into the power of their enemies who permitted them, God had permitted them to be oppressed by them. God permitted them to be led in the Assyrian and the Babylonian captivities. God laid his hand still even more heavily and punished them upon them when he subjected them into the hard yoke of the proud Romans. The scepter of the power of Judah was taken away because they turned their back on God. Jerusalem, together with the temple, was razed to the ground and remains to this day as a monument of punishment with which our Lord visited his once chosen people in their holy city for their infidelity. No other nation on earth has been elevated and distinguished as the Israelites have been, and no other one has been so deeply humiliated and punished. But in order that this sad fate of the Hebrew people may not overtake us, we should be careful to receive by prophet the visitations of God. Pious Catholics see in the visitations of Almighty God, whether they be sad or whether they be joyful visitations, the pious Catholics see a hand of a gracious father. This is the difference between a Catholic and an infidel. He who does not penetrate with faith the divine providence searches the whole world through but cannot find the cause of the adverse events of life. The ungodly man looks to the stars the divide dives deep into the depths of the earth hoping to discover the hidden causes of the various effects of nature. And he's often misled and deceived. He acknowledges the hand of man. He sees the power of nature. But he does not perceive the finger of God, which directs both of them, the hand of man and the powers of nature, according to God's will. But the Catholic, the pious Catholic, in considering earthly events, rises above the mundane causes up to Almighty God and understands God to be the great cause of things. This is true wisdom, which alone can make a man happy and even content in the hardest lot of life. Every visitation of God should also have a higher object in mind and in view. And that higher object is the salvation of our souls. St. Paul says it in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your sanctification. 
He also says in the book of Romans, we know that to them that love God, all things work together unto good. Every event is not merely willed or permitted by God in a general way, but is ordained by his loving wisdom ultimately and especially for the sanctification of our souls. We must be educated for the things for eternal life. And both joy and sorrow are the teachers appointed by God for our instruction for our eternal life. Joyful visitation should be incentives to a greater love and fidelity to Almighty God. Joy widens the heart of man and urges man forward to the love of God as a source of all happiness. Love is the sister of joy, and it enters into the soul of man if its natural dispositions have not been despoiled by sin. Joyful visitation should also awaken in our hearts a greater and a purer subjection to divine providence and an entire resignation to God's will. A holy obedience to the commands of God is a proof of our love, without which our love would only be a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. This nobler love of God and this obedience to his holy will should be our answer to our good and gracious Father in every visitation in his mercy that he sends to us. Because he also sends to us visitations of sorrow for the salvation of our souls. And these must be accepted in the very same spirit. They are calls which admonish us to return to him. They are efforts of Almighty God's love to forcibly detach us from the things of this earth. And they are at the same time wholesome and penitential exercises for our sins. Joy and happiness often intoxicate and mislead the heart of man. Many sinners who are oppressed by want and misfortune return to God after the pleasures of life have caused them to forget Almighty God. When God sends afflictions, he does so in order to break the bonds and the chains us to earth and to remind us of our true fatherland. St. Augustine very beautifully explains the necessity of pain and sorrow. He says, so that the wanderer who travels this earthly home, travels towards his heavenly home, does not stop in the earthly stable instead of his father's house in heaven. Sorrow is the great law of earthly life because of sin. He who has sinned must atone, must atone for his faults and purify his soul by present sufferings of this life in order to avoid the eternal sufferings of hell. We should bless and joyfully receive every visitation of sorrow which our Lord may send to us. He calls us to himself by earthly suffering and admonishes us to remember remember heaven remember eternity if almighty God inflicts deep and bleeding wounds in our hearts he acts like a surgeon who by this means heals the whole body may we be patient under the chastising hand of God so that the sufferings and tears of this life will wash our, away from our souls the stains of sin and render our wounded hearts pure and beautiful in the sight of God. The visitations of God await us in the future, and we know not whether they will be joyful or sorrowful visitations. God's visitations sometimes approach slowly so that we can foresee them coming, but generally, as experience teaches us, God's visitations overtake us suddenly and unexpectedly. And as we do not know what the future holds for us, we should raise our eyes to him who carries our lot of life in his hand. And through him, may he lead us through the paths of this world, either through joy or sorrow, so that our paths in this world will lead us to our eternal home in heaven. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.